Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome to worship this morning at Pilgrim United Church of Christ. We here at Pilgrim are glad that you could join us. Now you might notice that we're in a little bit of a different setting. I am recording this week at my home because my family and I have contracted COVID. Don't worry, we're all doing well, drinking lots of fluids and getting lots of rest. And after months of being in your home, I'm very grateful to be able to invite you into mine. Grace and peace to you this morning. Please join me in our call to celebrate. We, friends, belong to the day. Indeed, we are children of the light. We, friends, understand that new life is not birthed through comfort. Indeed, new life comes through pain. The sound of groaning fills the air as labor progresses. We, friends, in the midst of the nighttime, keep our eyes on the stars. 
holding our gaze to the light that glimmers. We, friends, begin to see the light cast a glow in the eastern sky. So we put on our cloak of love and we tie the belt of faith. We, friends, remember our destinies, that every morning we step out of bed, our feet hit the ground, and we go with Christ. Please join me in our unison prayer. Great God, today we hold to what is true and beautiful, the gift of this day and the blessing of our lives. Help us to navigate this season in all of its strangeness. When we are in need of comfort, help us to feel your presence. When we are in need of strength, Help us to feel your spirit. When we are in need of community, help us to feel the prayers that surround us. As we relish in the blessing of this day, might we have the courage to be a blessing to others. Amen. Our reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25 verses 14 through 30. The parable of the talents. For it as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and trusted his property to them, to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. 
the one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of the slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Please join me in a moment of prayer. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Admittedly, I don't know much about the stock market. All that I've learned about the stock market and investments I have picked up from my financial advisor who's up in Kiel. Eleven years ago, my husband and I trusted him with our investments and our 401ks and to walk us through the savings process so that one day we would be able to retire. And I remember the first time that I sat down with him. I was 23 years old, I was newly ordained, loaded with student debt, I had just obtained a very shiny, fresh and new 30-year mortgage, and a car payment. And I sat down in his office with an estimate of our potential yearly contributions along with my employer contributions, which then and still seems like a lot of money to me. And he started going over all of the options that we had. He started talking about how we could invest in bonds and in savings accounts so that these accounts would grow and mature slowly. But he told me that these would be very low return if we decided to go the low risk route and they would be predictable. And when I heard the word predictable, I heard the word safe. He looked at me and he said, Ashley, sometimes the safest isn't the smartest. And I think he said that because he saw the look on my face. And looked at me again and said, Ashley, you're 23 years old. The smartest option for you is actually the highest risk. And then he used a lot of words that I didn't really understand at the time. And admittedly, I still don't. And then he brought out the charts. He brought out all of the charts that documented the ebbs and flows of the stock market versus savings account. And he showed me one after one the benefits of going high risk comparing 
investments to savings bonds. And sure enough, as I sat there in his office years ago, it did look like we would be much better off in the long run, not playing it safe, but taking the highest risk. And up until that point and this point in my life, I have understood concretely that the clearest and safest and least risky choice was always the smartest. I suppose I could chalk it up to my overly cautious upbringing or the simple truth that long ago, we as human beings were driven by the evolutionary trait to survive each and every day, to preserve what we have, to play it safe and to protect it with our entire being. And if I'm being honest, that was my initial gut reaction back then sitting in my financial advisor's office, to protect and preserve what I had. And I lobbied hard that day for a standard bond savings account, but he pushed back. And he said, Ashley, growth only comes with risk. Growth only comes with risk. And risk only and always comes with fear. And for some people like myself, it's hard to wrap our head around the idea that risk is good. Sure, we understand the process of growth. Sure, we expect discomfort. But I think a lot of us get stuck at this idea of fear. And that's precisely what we see in Matthew, Matthew's Gospel this morning, in the lesson of the talents. We have this story that every single time I read it, I have to read it again and again because at its first reading, it doesn't make sense to me because I feel bad for the final servant. He protected what he had been given. He didn't risk losing it. He didn't risk making it larger. He risked keeping it safe. And he treasured it enough to make sure that he didn't lose it. And I'm sure that this talent's presence in his life compelled and controlled him while he had possession of it. And I'm not sure that he expected to get in trouble when the master returned. And when the master returns, indeed, he does get in trouble because he let his fear get in the way of growth. And this passage makes sense when we look at it in terms of lenses of investments and stock markets and long-term growth. But it also makes sense when we imagine this passage to be about the kingdom of God. We have to remember that the kingdom of God has never come without risk. The kingdom of God has never arrived from moments of playing it safe because the movement towards justice has never arrived because someone followed the rules. Instead, the movement towards justice has only occurred because someone dared to break the rules and push the boundaries. Progress has only occurred because someone dared to take risks. People who understood the cost of losing everything is far less than the cost and the risk of standing still. That idea is seen over and over throughout the course of our human history. It begins all the way back with Christ himself, who at this moment, as he tells this parable, was in the middle of his very own high-risk narrative. And I wondered about this story this week, friends, how it seems to be a prophetic precursor to all of the high-risk moments that have been written since this moment. Since this moment, Jesus uttered these words and introduced us to these servants. And as I read this passage and thought about risks and investments and long-term gains, I couldn't help but remember the image of a woman named Rosa Parks sitting in a bus. She sat stoically, unwavering. And in that moment, you can see on her face how she weighed her risk how she held her fear, and in that moment, how she chose growth and discomfort. And I remember an image of a small Ruby Bridges clutching her books to her chest as she walked up school steps in Louisiana 
as she was the first to desegregate schools. I know that her and her parents probably had lots of conversations about weighing the risks, about choosing to hold on to fear or move towards growth. And then, of course, there is Dr. King himself, one of the greatest examples. He knew and understood risk. He knew and understood that in his heart, this risk would mean his very own life. But he weighed that risk. He weighed that risk with the cost of doing nothing, and he chose growth. And there are so many men and women that have followed him during the civil rights movement that have followed his suit, that have chosen growth over fear and have transformed this world. And later in the 1970s, I think of a man named Harvey Milk, who for the early part of his life played it safe, but eventually realized that he was more compelled by the growth of justice than his own fear. And he set his life on a trajectory of winning the rights for LGBTQ folks. And I believe he understood, much like Dr. King, the risks that were involved with this. I believe he understood that eventually this may cost him his life. But he weighed those risks and he chose growth. And there were so many others throughout the latter part of the 20th century that followed him, that followed him and chose growth over fear. And they transformed the world. Friends, when we're talking about the kingdom of God, the stakes are incredibly high. And when the stakes are incredibly high, we know that they are not comfortable. Nor do they tend to be easy, nor do they arrive without fear. And I think that this passage reminds us that the good and faithful work that we do is not marked with protecting what we have out of our fear for ourselves, out of fear that we may lose what we have. But it comes from the knowing that nothing about the kingdom of God has ever been comfortable. It comes from knowing that nothing about doing the work of justice, that doing the work of God here and now will be marked without risk. Nothing about the pursuit of the kingdom of God is safe, friends. It's a long-term investment that seeks to make gains in the reach and scope of justice and equity. It's a long-term game that looks far beyond our our lives and our futures into the future that waits for our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. It demands that we are so compelled by this vision that we dare not bury the talents given to us, but that we take the grace and the talents that have been given to us through the faith that we confess and we work every single day to multiply it to multiply it for others outside of ourselves. And not hoard it, and not bury it, out of safekeeping and fear. Friends, we have been trusted with this gift. We have been trusted with these talents. We, friends, have been trusted with the very kingdom of God. And this passage reminds us that this world has never inched closer to the kingdom of God because people dared to play it safe. Rather, this world has been changed by people who dared to risk, by people who understood risk, who understood fear, but who also understood growth. And we in the church, we must have a growth mindset. A growth mindset that's not measured in dollars or cents, but a growth mindset that is alone measured in justice, in peace, in equity, above all, forgiveness and grace. And we, friends, here and now in this year 2020, we have to believe that this kingdom is worth 
the investment. We have to believe that this kingdom, that our lives and the lives of those that come after is worth the risk. We must believe that the pursuit of this investment should be marked with growth. Even if that growth comes coupled with a whole lot of risk and a whole lot of fear. And friends, we must remember we must remember that sometimes the safest choice might not always be the most faithful choice. Blessings to you, friends, in this season of risk, in this season of fear, in this season of growth. I pray that today you are compelled by the grace that goes before you and the faith that lives inside of you as we seek to be the body of Christ in this world. Thanks be to God. Amen. this time I would like to invite those of you who are gathered this morning in your homes to take a moment and share your joys and concerns, your highs and lows with those who are gathered with you this morning. If you are worshiping alone, as always, I would like to invite you to give a friend a call or a close family member and check up on them and ask if they have highs or lows, or if you can pray together or pray for one another. And this morning, I'd like to continue to hold all of those who have contracted COVID-19 in our thoughts and in our prayers. I would like to lift up a, spe a special prayer for Tim, who has been living with COVID for a number of weeks, and prayers for Marilyn as she walks beside him. I'd like to ask prayers for Brandon and Rihanna who have been struggling with the virus as well. And for all of you who are worshiping with us this morning, who have family and friends, who have lost loved ones or close friends to this disease. We pray together this morning and we gather all of our joys, all of our concerns together in this moment of prayer. Good and gracious God, in this season of thanksgiving, help us to be mindful of the blessings that surround us. Help us to be mindful of the blessing of the sunlight, of the warmth of this day, of the cool of the night, of the soft comfort of sleep. As we live and move in this world that continues to be in flux, we ask that you guide us in our waking and you guard us in your sleeping. For all of those that have fallen ill, we ask for your comfort and respite. For all of those who mourn and grieve, whether those losses are recent or distant, we ask for your presence and strength. For 
for all of those that continue to battle illnesses of the body and mind. We ask for your sustenance and support and for all of those in our lives who continue to find moments of goodness and blessing who continue to remember how to laugh and how to smile, we give you thanks for their very presence. Give us the courage to rise each day, great God, and know that we have the ability to be your hands and feet in this world. So let us care for one another and this world. Let us lift up each other in prayer. As we pray for Tim and Brandon and Rhiannon, as we pray for the family and friends of Vic, who has passed away. We offer prayers for our healthcare professionals and support staff, for nurses, for doctors, for teachers and students and administrators. We ask prayers for parents and grandparents and neighbors and aunts and uncles and mothers and fathers who continue to work and mothers and fathers who continue to remain at home. Remind us that in these days, even though we are apart, you weave us together as your body, as your people, bound together by our faith in you and our love for each other. And we are united by the grace of Christ, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, I would like to lift up a couple announcements to all of you. For all of you who received this worship service in an email, I would like to remind you to take a moment and read the announcements that accompanied the service in the email. A few things I would like to lift up. We are taking reservations for the at-home Advent wreath kits. So if you would like one, please contact Lisa in the church office. You can give her a call or send her an email. We do have a limited number of these available. The limited number is quite large, but there are still a limited number. And also, as we look forward to the Advent season, for any of you that would like to once again join in the tradition of Christmas caroling for our homebound members, I would like to invite you to contact Corey Jepson Hobbs, the head of our care team, and express your interest to her. You can give her a call, you can send her an email, or you can let the church office know and we will relay that message to her. I believe that would be the normal weekend in December, so please, if you're at all interested in coming Christmas caroling with us, although it will be socially distanced and there will be no ride shares, please know that you're invited to join us. It will be a wonderful afternoon for us to go out and see some of those we haven't seen in some time. And for all of you that are worshiping here with us for the first time, we're glad that you're here. This Sunday is a little bit different since I'm at home, but we are really glad that you found us and we hope that you found a community of faith that is as warm and welcoming as we perceive ourselves to be. And I just want to offer one more quick reminder. Uh, our Stewardship Drive has been completed and all of you should have received a pledge card in the mail. If you've not yet received that pledge card, please contact the church office and we will get one to you. And the Stewardship Committee um, is asking that you return those cards as soon as possible so that we can move forward with our anticipated budget for 2021 and make additions, corrections, or alterations as needed. And as always, I would like to say thank you to all of you for your continued support of this church. Your gifts, especially during this time, have enabled us to continue doing the work and ministry that we feel so called to. We believe that we have a particular place in Ozaki County as an open and affirming congregation in this time. So thank you to all of you who continue to support this congregation with your gifts, 
those gifts that are both financial and your gifts of time. Surely you are a blessing. And now I would like to invite us to pray together the prayer of thanksgiving. In gratitude, deep gratitude for this moment, this meal, these gifts, we give ourselves to you. Remind us to live as a changed people, refreshed by your presence and strengthened by the community that holds us. We have shared the gifts of God and cannot remain the same. Ask much of us, expect much from us, enable much by us, encourage many through us. This day, might we live as your body in this world. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Dear friends, you're invited to go. And as you go, remember that your faith might not always be the safest choice, but it will be the choice that yields blessings now and forever. And so now I would like to invite you to go with the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, this in all of your days. Thanks be to God. Amen.